I'm super comforted by the fact that it's uh, John Travolta and Kanye West and then me. That is, if, if I take nothing else away from this conference, that is, uh, that's my takeaway. Um, do I just hit the thing? Do I do that? Hey, there we go. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Dave Hansel. I'm uh, Facebook's global aviation policy leader, and I'm sure about 99.9% .9 of people in this room said, huh, Facebook has an aviation person. Okay. So like everyone in this room, I'm very struck by how much aviation is part of our community. It's, it is who we are. It's what we do. It's, it's integral to our life. And Facebook, our job, at least my job within Facebook, is to try to get as many people connected to the internet as possible. We have this overarching belief that the rising tides raise all ships and that the more we are connected to information, the better we function as a society, the smarter we are, the healthier we are, and the better we can interact with our fellow human beings. And nothing is more ever present in our lives really than aviation. Whether you're on a plane or there's one flying overhead, they're, they're out there and they're important. And our goal here is to try to integrate that more into connectivity solutions. So not just getting connectivity to aircraft, but using them as a backbone to provide connectivity. So Facebook's mission is, is to give uh, people the power to share and make the world a more open and connected place. And we've been doing that for years. We continue to do that. And a few years ago, we started working on a program with a number of organizations uh, under the internet.org umbrella, which was designed to bring access to the 60% of the world that do not presently have internet connectivity, whether that's unconnected people or underconnected people. The world as we see it today is really divided into about a third and, and two thirds, where a third of the planet, maybe, hey, there we go, um, is actually uh, connected and they're fine. They're, it's the experience that you and I are all used to where we can pick up our phone and we get this really rich data experience and that wasn't supposed to happen. But in about two thirds of the world, folks do not have connectivity or at best they have 2G connectivity. And what that gives you is the ability to talk, the ability to text, but you're not really streaming anything, you're not downloading big data, you're not seeing videos, you're not having the experience that we are all having. This thing, there we go. So 3.2 billion connected, but that leaves a very large 4.1 billion unconnected or underconnected. This thing is being rough. Okay, so this is a map, this is a, a, about a year and a half ago, maybe two now, um, of the average connectivity in the world. And you can see, here's the United States, wonderful yellow color, 4G or LTE or higher. Um, Europe, they get mad when I show this slide over there because they will argue that they're much higher than that. Asia. But what's concerning us the most is those places with either no light or red light. So like if you go to India, um, they have great technology there. You look up on, a, on a, um, an antenna stack and you can look at that piece of equipment and go, I know that that can handle 4G. Why are they not having a 4G experience? And what we find is that it's the backbone. It's not that piece of equipment. It's the pipe that the data has to travel through. So we look at this connectivity challenge kind of across three spectrums. We look at infrastructure, affordability, and relevance. We sort of take relevance off the map for us. Um, relevance, we feel, is something that you develop internally, you develop locally, you develop it in your nation. That's not our job. We'll partner with people to do that but it's not our position to do that. But what we can help with is infrastructure and affordability. What we have to do is we have to provide the capability at a cost that's manageable for people to get connected. So when you're looking in high density population areas, uh, like over on the left, a big city, you have consistent power, you have great utilities, you can put up an antenna, no problem. So there's terrestrial solutions that we can help develop and we're working on all the time to try to make better, stronger, faster, et cetera. And when you get out into incredibly low population densities, satellites are an incredibly effective tool. They are fantastic until you reach a certain population density and then they start to fall off in, in, um, in what they're able to provide. But in those environments at the cost, they're amazing. But the challenge we have is that the bulk of people who are unconnected, about 80% of the people out there of that 4.1 billion who are not connected, they live in the middle. They live in a place where they're outside of the city in parts of the world where literally at the end of the city line, that's where the electricity stops. That's where the fiber line probably stops. Um, so how do we help that solution? And, and our perspective at that point, it becomes a physics problem. It becomes how do we get more data quicker, less latency in a bigger pipe? And the way we think that we should be doing that is using unmanned aircraft. 
So going back a couple of years, we designed and built uh, what you see here, which is the Aquila aircraft. Um, very low drag, very low weight, coming in at about 450 kilogram, solar powered, battery charged overnight aircraft, which is gonna carry a communications payload, which will help enable that backbone. And what we envision is that you have an internet gateway, probably again at the end of a, a, a city um, line, and somewhere near that gateway, we're gonna put an aircraft up in the air. We're gonna beam a signal up to that aircraft using millimeter wave, and then possibly have multiple aircraft in a constellation downrange, communicating with the, the mothership using uh, free space optics or lasers. And that will carry the data all the way down line. And we can service an area right now, according to our calculations, of about a 100 kilometer circle on the ground and provide really great throughput um, and really great capability to people who might otherwise not be able to get connected. And all we need is somewhat reasonable power, a generator, uh, to power a receiver bay at, pick the place, a local tea shop, uh, a, a business person who has decided they want to provide internet capability for their neighborhood, or uh, a mobile network operator or an ISP. We don't want to be in the ISP business. We want to be that backbone because we think that's the kind of the sweet spot for where we can make the biggest difference. Um, and the aircraft profile, I think one of the challenges we have is, is how do we fit UAS into the existing system while concurrently trying to change the existing system to make it more amenable and, and open to our type of operation. So what we've come up with is, again, that get on the right, that gateway serving the unmanned aircraft system, sending that signal up to the aircraft. Ground control station launches and recovers the aircraft, one pilot, one vehicle. Um, but once they get up to our cruise altitude, which we envision to be between 60 and 90,000 feet, so I'm not upsetting any airlines, um, we switch control of that aircraft over to a fleet operations center. And in that fleet operations center, it, the aircraft are operating autonomously, and you have pilots or operators who are available to intercede if the aircraft reaches some sort of critical problem that it cannot solve itself. Um, and at that point, a pilot would then work with air traffic control or whatever UTM system we're using to bring that aircraft back down through the stack, avoiding every, uh, every airline out there who will be very, very mad when my 40 mile an hour plane comes scooting through their jet route. And the other challenge we have when you get up to that altitude, I mean, you have about 100 challenges at least, but how do we power this? Fuel's not an option. We need better batteries. We need better solar cells. So what we envision is that when the lights come on in the morning, right at sunrise, the aircraft's at 60,000 feet, and it spends the next X hours, depending on where on the globe it is, climbing up to about 90,000 feet. The lights come out at night, same exercise in reverse. We use the battery energy that we've stored overnight and rotate back down uh, to the ground. There's a lot of challenges in this space. Everyone in here knows there are challenges in aviation, so it is almost ridiculous to say, oh, we have challenges. Everybody's got challenges in this room. But what we want to do, what Facebook has been trying to do with all of our infrastructure connectivity programs is to try to help solve those challenges. Um, so we're partnering with airlines, we're partnering with manufacturers, we're working with regulators to try to make a better space for all of us to operate within, to ideally help connect that last 66% of the planet that doesn't enjoy the experience the way that we do online. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. I saw a thing recently that says you're supposed to finish like 20% early and then everyone will love you. So this is going to be the best presentation you've had all day if it's not John Travolta. So thank you very much. And again, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I did not mention it. Um, we'd like to get between 10 and 20 gig uh, throughput. So we're working on it. We have, so those kind of solutions are, are useful, not just in these applications. I mean, shooting lasers or shooting millimeter wave a long distance is, is helpful in tons of settings. So we're working on that. Um, we have offices down in, uh, in LA that, that are working on that. And, and we plan to apply that not just to this solution, but to a lot of, a lot of solutions. We're, we're getting pretty good at, at, at data throughput. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. It is more a question, that's where kind of relevance sort of overlaps with this, because it's not really up to us to make that determination. We want to partner with the nations and where we are going to be flying to find out 
where are the gaps that you need help filling? And partnering with the civil aviation authorities, the mobile network operators, satellite providers, to understand, look, we just can't hit area X. And then when the governments tell us, yeah, and we can't afford to drag a fiber line out to area X. So we don't have, like, we don't say, okay, Nigeria, just as an example, we need X aircraft. We haven't gotten to that phase yet. Yeah. Yep, that's correct. <laughs> it's a it's a challenge. We know that. Um, we love challenges. I'm okay with that. We'll we'll figure it out. Good question. Um. Not really. It's a, it's a moving, it's a bit of a moving uh, target. Um, I'd like to see them up within the next five years on a, on a regular basis somewhere in the world. Um, what the cover, whether that's a thousand aircraft, whether that's one, not there yet. I thought someone, way over there. I had a question, why did you choose, or, or why are you taking the option to use unmanned aircraft as a repeater, as opposed to a existing tall, say, an AM radio tower that's already existing and doesn't appear? Um, yeah, that's a very, that's a, the engineers decided that was a good thing. Um, I don't have a good technical answer that would provide that, but our data sciences folks looked at the problem of these isolated areas and whether or not that was viable at a certain cost point to get it done, and, and that's what they came back with. There are solutions, there are places, topographies that would support that, but not, they're not as ubiquitous. Do you have an estimated idea of how much it would cost relative to satellite technology? No, I do not. I do not. We do. Um, from a policy perspective, that's not something I, I work on. So we, I mean, we want to, we obviously have to be competitive, right? We have to be able to beat the cost of dragging a fiber line out to wherever and supporting that for X number of years. Um, and we have to be able to be competitive to partner with or uh, serve areas where satellites are not existing. Because if not, why not just put up a new satellite, right? That Put up a LEO or a, you know, something else. Um, so we have to be able to beat that cost. So whatever that is, we want to be under that. Facebook has any plans to the satellites. I'm sorry? Facebook has any plans to the satellites. We have plans, we look at everything. Um, we look at all sorts of solutions to, to connectivity. So to say we have plans, it's not something, um, it's not something that's in my purview. Um, but we, we are looking at everything and we talk to just about every company. I would not be surprised if we talked with people in here on some level, but, um, but it's not something that I work on. That's gonna be a lot of my answers. My apologies for that, but we keep, I keep on aviation. I'm good at it, apparently. I can hear him. Oh, yeah, for everyone else. Ha <laughs> And the recording. I'm not the only person here. Good for me. Thank you. Mike Lukin from TTP, Cambridge, UK. Um, uh, how often do you think uh, those aircraft actually have to land? Because they cannot be no, uh, yeah. flying all the time, right? We'd like to get to 90 days. Um, we think 90 days is a sweet spot on a lot of levels um, where we see battery technology going, that's probably one of the biggest drivers. So regular maintenance on the aircraft, obviously, um, but battery recharge cycles is a huge issue. Um, they, as you probably know, they start to diminish in their capability and the um, likelihood of getting a full charge in whatever sunlight is available during that period on that latitude um, makes it so we might have to contemplate either moving the aircraft closer to the equator or bringing them down and replacing them with something else simply because of the battery recharge. But ideally, we could get to 90 days. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you could give an update on Tether Tenor. Um, yeah, Tether Tenor, you probably saw it. At, uh, we had our F8 um, conference a couple months ago. And Tether Tenor is a partnership that we worked on um, to try to get, um, for those who haven't seen it, uh, basically sort of a, a small unmanned helicopter with a power antenna that can provide capabilities and connectivity in places that don't have it in cases such as disaster relief. Um, there's a million regulatory hurdles to, to get over to accomplish that. Um, but we've had some really successful test flights. We've run it for over 24 hours nonstop. 
um, in a, a couple test locations. So it's a project we're still working on. Um, we're just trying to figure out the way forward on it. But it's been great so far. The, the manufacturers have been incredibly forward thinking and, and soft antennas aren't anything terribly new, um, but the amazing leaps and bounds that have been made in unmanned aircraft in the past few years have made things like that versus a dirigible or a small, say, five meter balloon, a really viable option. So um, we're looking at, I think big, one of the big challenges is where's that a better solution than just inflating a, a, a balloon, right? Um, and so again, that's partnering with and understanding what's going on on the ground. So we're working on it. It's really fantastic. All those technologies, are everything, again, I'm preaching to the convert, everything that flies is so cool. Um, and, and that's just another aspect of how neat those things are. I'm, I'm trying to justify the, the economics of installing a network that's going to be above an area where the per capita income of, an, of, of the people are measured in hundreds of dollars. Sure. And I, I'm trying to figure out that piece. How is this going to be covered? How are the enormous costs of this going to be covered to sure. serve people that don't have the means yeah. to support it? Um, I'm concerned primarily with connectivity. Um, I'm primarily concerned with getting people online. And I'm not saying that, that I ignore that or that we as a, as a company ignore that. Um, but our focus is instead on how do we make it happen. Um, I don't think it's a good approach to focus first on what can people pay us. I think that's the, I think that's the wrong way to look at the paradigm for us. Um, which is very different than a lot of the aviation industry, right? Um, we want to get people connected, and we think the world is a better place and w when people are. And whether that's dollars or measuring it in these people's lives are better, I'm, I'm more concerned about the social benefit. A um, little different business model. I would say it's not even just... It's not which specific regulations are challenging, it's the, both the dearth of and the inconsistency of regulations at that altitude. Um, it's a patchwork. Once you get above normal commercial air traffic routes, it's, it is a real patchwork. And so to try to harmonize that in a, in a global sense is, is one of the big challenges. Um, I'd say uh, type certificate reciprocity is probably one of the big ones as well. Um, right now, there's, that doesn't exist for unmanned aircraft. So you type cert your Boeing here in the US, you can fly to the UK, no, no big deal. Unmanned systems don't enjoy that, that same privilege. So, so that's one of them. But I think harmonizing that regulatory framework around the world is, is probably one of the biggest challenges that, that we have in front of us. And, and, and I don't think that's, up until X number of years ago, within the past decade, no, nobody was really flying up there outside of fast movers and people who don't want to talk about it, right? Um, so I understand why that exists, but the, the future is here now. Um, this, needs to, this needs to be moved along. I'll take one more. Uh, good morning, Bruce Holmes from Smart Sky Networks. Um, you may be aware of and maybe even participating in some of the NASA and FAA research on uh, U.S. operations in the national airspace system sure. of various kinds. Um, so just in general, are you um, comfortable currently with the path that those projects, research projects, have underway? Have they taken into account your operating concept in a uh, fashion that is uh, satisfying currently? Um. Currently, it would be hard for us to fly um, here in the U.S. as an example. Um, but what I think NASA and so the second part of that is is the future. I do think that the efforts led by NASA to assess high altitude UTM is incredibly valuable. I think their concepts of UTM for low level are amazing. Um, I think they've done really, really good cooperative work, and I think we're going to see more of that in the high altitude space. Um, so today. Tough. Future, I see the regulators are very approachable. FAA's case, um, it's always, they want to hear your safety data, right? They want to, they, they, your business case is, wow. But what they want to hear is, how are you making it safe? And I think that's, a, that's great. Um, and 
they are staying that path in their partnership with, with NASA, I think. I don't want to speak for them, but, but that's their approach. And we want to be partners in that as well. Nobody here wants any aircraft to be operating at a level that's not safe. And so we want to be, we want to be partners with that. And I, do, I'm, I'm, I, am, I am cautiously optimistic that, that everything's moving in the right direction. People really want to fix this. Thank you. Sure. I had a question along lines of safety when sure. you mentioned that. What are the risk factors to study the safety for the pilots that are going to be flying that you're projected between the Earth and sure, yeah. unmanned vehicles to protect their safety and their careers? So the laser uh, wouldn't be used for, for ground to surface. Uh, we would use millimeter wave, regular old spectrum, to communicate up to the aircraft. Aircraft to aircraft communication would be done by lasers, and we're up at sixty to ninety thousand feet. Um, but obviously, you know, we we consider that all the time. So we partner with FDA to, and FAA to look at at how that's how that's applicable, if at all. Because um, if you're up at sixty and you're banging a laser downrange to hit another aircraft, curve of the earth, it's going to go out into space. It's not going to be a factor for any commercial pilots because that's that's huge. I mean, we don't. That's people's livelihood and uh, and people's lives. So yeah, we're not flipping about that. So, well, thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you again. This this community is everyone. We're not here. We're here because we're passionate about this. I'm here because I'm passionate about aviation. So thank you uh, for what you're all doing to try to make uh, life sef uh, safer and more vibrant out there in the aviation community. Thank you. Thank you.